Okay, well, it's my pleasure to um, introduce Dr. Jacqueline Bruce, and she'll be talking about um, fibro papillomas and sea turtles. It's common problems due to cancer, due to pollution, and other human effects. So, I want you to pronounce that word, though. Uh, <laughs> you right, fibro papillomas? Close. Very close. <laughs> <laughs> I'll get it for you, don't worry. <laughs> I saw the picture as a chomper with the great big basketball size thing on his flipper. Oh my god. Do you want me to go ahead and share my screen then? Are you ready? Mm -hmm. All right. Can anyone hear me? Yep. 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 Okay. Perfect. Just checking. All right. I'm going to go ahead and share my screen then. So, there we go. All yeah. right, so my talk tonight is fap fi oh, now I can't even say it, fibropapillomatosis and sea turtles. Um, as Doreen said, my name is Dr. Jacqueline Bruce. I'm a general practice veterinarian down in the area. Um, I actually work out in Tarpon Springs, or I guess for y'all up in Tarpon Springs um, at St. Francis Pet Care Center. I'm one of two veterinarians over there that will also see exotic animals. So Dr. Aslan Brandt is my cohort. She will also see exotics, um, pretty much anything that can walk in the door. I used to work with sea turtles, which is where this talk is coming from. Um, unfortunately, since moving to the Tampa area, I have not been able to get back in with any places. So if anyone knows anyone that works with sea turtles, let me know. I will be happy to come and help out. Um, these guys have become one of my passions. But I was thinking about what to talk about tonight. Um, for those of you that have been to my talks before, I'm kind of taking a little bit of a different turn. Instead of talking about veterinary medicine and husbandry and things like that, um, I started thinking about what's going on in the world right now. And obviously, as affecting the group, we are having a pandemic. And as you think about that, there are tons of pandemics that are going on around us that don't get as much hype as our current COVID-19 is. Um, so I wanted to talk about one that's affecting the sea turtles and fibro, fibropapillomatosis, which for the rest of this talk we will call FP, make it much easier for everyone. Um, FP has become a pandemic in these guys. So I um, don't know if you can see all of this. It should show up. Um, fibropapillomatosis is it's actually a cancer. So if you think about it, it's weird. This is caused by a virus. But warts in people, like the little warts you get on your skin, those are actually due to a papilloma virus in people. Um, this particular type of cancer, used, we used to think it was a papilloma virus, like the people one, but we've actually mostly determined that this is a herpes virus. And just like herpes viruses in people, they don't ever go away. Once you get a herpes virus, it is in your DNA. Um, unfortunately, we cannot prove beyond a shadow of a doubt that the herpes virus causes this condition in sea turtles, but the working theory is that Chelonid herpes virus 5 is the causative agent. The reason why, not to be too detailed for you guys, but there is this theory called Cox postulates. That is a, basically a process by which you prove what causes a disease. So if I have a disease such as FP and I want to prove that Chelonid herpes virus 5 causes it, I have to take a naive animal, so a sea turtle who has no disease, I have to give him this virus, and then he has to develop the disease. Two big problems with that. One, herpes viruses are traditionally very difficult to replicate in a lab, so making it is very difficult. Um, the other thing is, thankfully, for the sea turtle populations, all of them are considered either vulnerable or endangered everywhere in the world. So good for the sea turtles because their populations have been severely decimated by our influence. But because they're protected, no one is going to approve a study where you take a healthy turtle and give him cancer. Understandably so, but it limits our ability from scientific perspective to prove it. So if you'll bear with me for tonight's talk for the tents and purposes here, we are going to blame Chelonid herpes virus 5 for this condition. Um, either way, it is a condition that causes cancer, like I said, it can cause internal and external tumors. So tumors that you can see on the outside of the body as well as those on the inside. 
And because they can be pretty much anywhere, they can cause a multitude of different symptoms. For the most part, if you see them on the outside of the body, if they're external tumors, you're going to see them on what we call the soft tissue. So in people, all of this, our hands, our skin, everything is soft tissue. In turtles and tortoises, they have external, non, external shell, so it's not, non, it's not all soft tissue. You'll typically see these tumors arriving on the flippers, on the face, especially the neck, around the cloacal area on the tail. We will actually see them randomly in between the scoots on the shell, um, but that's less common. And these tumors can get pretty large. I'm going to show you a picture in a little bit of a, the largest one to date on a sea turtle. Internal tumors, they can grow anywhere. Most commonly, we'll see them on the lungs, not necessarily in the lungs, which is good, on the outside of the kidneys and on the heart. So the struggle is, if you think about what are the most important organs in our body, what do we need to survive? The heart, the lungs, the kidney. Um, to date, we don't see them that often on the brain, which is good, but that would also be a difficult place for the average hospital to diagnose and document. Um, so I'll throw that out there as it's still a possibility. The question becomes, where does it come from? How did it get here? We don't know is the biggest answer. Um, it started in 1938. So in the 1930s, they off the coast of the Florida Keys, actually, they found the first green sea turtle who had FP disease, causing tumors on the outside of his body. Um, since the 1930s, it has spread worldwide. So any coastal area in the subtropical zone, that's going to include, obviously, us. It's going to include Australia, Hawaii. All of those places in what we consider subtropical have seen turtles with this condition. European countries, Asian countries, the coast of California, all of those. Um, and it spread pretty much like wildfire. With, by the 1960s, we were seeing it everywhere. Good news, bad news with that. Good news, it's everywhere, which means there's a lot of people involved. There are a lot of scientists putting their minds together, trying to figure out what to do about this virus. Bad news, obviously, it affects a lot of turtles. Um, and it's been documented to affect between 50 and 70% of the population. So if you can imagine if COVID-19 affected 50 to 70% of us, we'd be having a much different conversation about Halloween and that kind of stuff coming up. Um, so 50 to 70% is pretty high. Question then becomes why is it not 100%? And that's where the environmental factors come in. So again, we blame us for most of the problems in the animal world. They've documented more cases of FP in areas with agricultural runoff, so pesticides running off into the ocean, um, high populations of people, so just the population density itself can lead to more FP virus. And then we will also see it in places that have a lot of pollution. Interestingly enough, all of the sea turtles in the world are affected with the exception of the leatherback sea turtle. So I included a couple of pictures here. Um, down in the bottom right-hand corner is the green sea turtle. That is the poster child for this disease. He gets it the most, frequent, most frequently. Almost every sea turtle that I, green sea turtle that I saw in the Keys when I was down there had FP disease. Even if they came in for a boat strike or a shark bite or whatever else have you, they almost all had tumors on the outside of their body. To the left of him is a little loggerhead sea turtle. This is Pip. You will see him several times in this study. This, he was my favorite patient out of all the patients in four years. He was a great turtle. Um, he did not have FP, so he's a little bit of a sneak attack. But he's representing the loggerheads who do get this. And then up in the top right, you'll see a hawksbill turtle. Um, if you, hopefully anyone who has tortoise shell earrings, shoes, glasses, have fake ones. If you happen to have real jewelry that's made from tortoise shell, it is made from this turtle. Um, if you have real ones, just don't tell me. We'll be good. But um, all of these turtles are affected. Kemp's Ridley's can be affected. They are much, much less frequent in this area of the world, so I didn't include them in the pictures. But all of the turtles can be affected, with the exception of the leatherback, which kind of points towards pollution and agricultural runoff being involved. Um, leatherback turtles tend to live much further out. We're talking about much, much, much further in the deep, deep ocean. They can dive down hundreds more feet than the rest of the turtles can. Their environment is extremely different from where the rest of the sea turtles live. 
In addition to that, there's question as to what's different about their biology because they do live so much further out. Their nutrition is different. They can dive so much deeper. Their basic anatomy is so much different than the rest of the sea turtles because of that, that the theory is something in that biology enables them to not get this condition to be determined maybe in the future. Um, but I just find it interesting of all the sea turtles, they are the one that don't get it. So um, sometimes when I click skip, it doesn't go forward. Give me one second. Are they, is that contagious? Yes. So the virus itself, the herpes virus is contagious. Um, the most common herpes virus that you would think of in people is the virus that causes um, sores on people's lips. Herpes virus is extremely contagious and it's thought to live in the environment. So in an area that's heavily populated with sea turtles, in the sargasm, the grasses, even in the sand of the ocean floor, the theory is the herpes virus can live there for a while and potentially be contagious to any other turtle that comes in that area. So, and we'll talk about that more when we talk about monitoring these guys in a hospital setting, because when they're kept in the hospital, which hospital and turtle hospital world is a little bit different than human or even veterinary hospital, um, the water supply has to be kept extremely isolated. So any turtle that has FP, their water source is gonna be separate from every other turtle, both on the coming inside and the going outside. So it's, there's strict biosecurity that we have to keep to make sure that it doesn't spread to the other animals in the hospital. Um, so up here on this slide I have included, there are five hospitals in, the, in Florida that I am aware of to date that will treat FP turtles. And the turtle hospital down in Marathon, Florida, the middle key, um, Baca Key is one of the main five, and that's actually where this was first diagnosed. Um, so the Sea Turtle Hospital, you'll see in this picture here, it actually used to be a hotel, motel, a long time ago. Um, hurricanes have changed that, and a gentleman named Richie purchased it a while back, decades ago, um, and turned it from a motel into a Sea Turtle Hospital, which is pretty cool, because the pool, I'm gonna show you a picture of that, in the back of the hotel, um, has been turned into an amazing place for the sea turtles to swim around in. Um, you can see to the right there is an ambulance. They actually will drive up and down US-1, which connects all, most of the keys, to pick up turtles anywhere. They also have a boat, so they can go and pick up sea turtles. But the environment in the keys is just amazing. The people down there are awesome. There's a great network of, of everyone, really, who will rescue sea turtles. I've included um, here on to the left is just a regular old fisherman. He was out doing his job and saw the sea turtle floating around. And so he was able, amazingly enough, to get it into his boat. These guys are heavy and they don't want to be picked up. And they can slap really hard. They bite very hard. So there's some work that goes into getting them into a boat. But there's, if you go to the Keys to visit and you rent a boat to go out for the day, you will be given a phone number to call if you see a floating turtle. So the theory is a turtle does not want to be caught, as you well know, just with any other wild animal. And so if you see a turtle floating on the surface and you approach him in your boat, which you should only do if your propeller is going very slow, um, if he does not dive down, then there's a problem. He can't dive down because if he can, he would. Sometimes it's something simple, like they're caught in fishing line, but if they're not caught in fishing line and you can't just detach them, then the best thing to do is to bring them in for care. There's a lot of reasons they may be floating. FP is one of the most common ones. Um, but fish and wildlife is pretty active down there. They, if you're out and about and you see a floating turtle, you can call in and give the coordinates. Fish and wildlife will go pick them up. Um, we actually had some cases where the Coast Guard would go and pick them up. If you think about it, it's an expensive use of Coast Guard time and money. However, these animals are endangered. They're protected by our government. And so the Coast Guard is actually pretty active down there and will go and help bring them in. Everyone that comes in, here's another cameo of Pip. He's not an FP turtle, but he's a great picture of every turtle that comes in gets identified and documented. They're vulnerable or endangered. Well, all of them are endangered in Florida. So everything gets documented, everything is accessible, public record, and can be accessed by the governmental organizations at any time. The number at the top of the ruler there that starts with MAS, that is his unique number. Any turtle that's released gets a transponder, which is like a microchip, gets placed in them. This number is then his number for the rest of his life. 
Um, that's his name, Pip, and he was rescued on August 6, 2011. Everyone that comes in gets identified. If they have a transponder, it's scanned. If they don't have a transponder, they are given a new number, their name. Um, the nice thing is if you're down in the Keys at least, I can't speak for the other hospitals, but if you do find a turtle and rescue him, you get to name him. So that's the job is to find one so you can pick out his name. And then after they get documented, every single one of them gets a full workup, whether it is a FP turtle or any other reason for getting dropped off. Um, this is the last time you'll see Pip. In the left side there, those are Pip's x-rays. Every turtle gets radiographed. On the previous slide, the turtle, Pip, when you saw Pip getting his identification, he was actually on the radiology table at the time. They come straight in. They get x-rays to document. There's a lot we can tell about the health of a turtle. Um, but for our FP-specific turtles, we are looking to see if we can see any tumors inside of their body. So we talked before about the lungs are common places, and those would be easier to see on x-ray. Um, kidneys are common places. Those are hard to see on x-ray. The heart is almost impossible to see on x-ray. Um, so I don't think I get a mouse. But um, this is actually the black and white images there on the left are actually four radiographs or x-rays pieced together to make one image. And that shows the whole turtle body, essentially. Um, most of the dark gray that you see is gas in his intestines, um, but his lungs live on both sides there. The lungs of turtles are very different from mammals. I'm not sure how much of you are familiar with the anatomy of these guys, but the lungs, like if this is their carapace, which is their top shell, the lungs are closely adhered to that structure up here. So seeing them on this view is pretty hard, but if we angle the turtle sideways, then we can see the lung space pretty well. So they all get x-rays. If we see any tumors on the inside, on x-ray alone, um, that may be the last step that this turtle gets, unfortunately. But if we don't see any, which is the goal, then they go to endoscopy, which is the second picture here. Um, I don't know if any of you have ever had an upper GI study done or a colonoscopy done. Same process, essentially, just with a little bit of a different opening. So this is, in the picture here, this is a green sea turtle. He's laying on his left side. His carapace is towards me, and you're seeing the plaster on there. Um, the silver metal thing that you see with the white tip, that's actually the port that the camera goes into. So we'll make a small incision. This animal is under heavy sedation. He is not feeling anything right now. We'll put them under heavy sedation, and we'll go in with the camera. And that's the third picture you see there is actually, minimize this. The third picture you see there to the right is, you'll see the back of the turtle there, and that's me holding the camera in. It's hard to tell from the picture, and I apologize from that, but from the screen, we're actually able to visualize the internal organs of the turtle. We can see the surface of the lungs, the kidneys, um, the gonads, which are the reproductive organs, Pretty much everything from the outside. So I can't see the inside of the lungs, that's where the x-rays come in, um, but I can see the outsides. So basically we're looking for any kind of internal tumors with this workup. Um, as you can see from the middle picture there, this guy obviously has external tumors. Um, I'll try to walk you through it. With the middle picture going down from where the camera is, all of the kind of pink to off-white salmon colored spots are actually tumors on this turtle. And if you look on his, the inner surface of his top shell, there's a tumor there as well, which is abnormal. Those are harder to remove, but they are definitely removable. So those are all the tumors that he has. Um, as we're looking for all of these tumors, the, the tough reality is where we are right now with this disease, we can remove external tumors. They're easy enough to take off. I'll show you some pictures of that. Internal tumors, not so much. Um, I can't remove the lungs, the heart, or the kidneys of a turtle, and there is no such thing as transplants in turtles yet. So unfortunately, it's not something that we can change. It's the difference between being diagnosed with cancer and being diagnosed with metastatic cancer. If we see tumors on the inside, unfortunately, that is metastatic, and there's no treatment at this time. Fingers crossed that we will get there. Um, the next image. Dr. Bruce, I have a question. Um, on that x that's on the screen, are there tumors there that we can see? No, thankfully there's not. Um, so Pip, 
he's not an FP turtle, but to give you background on him, he actually came in because he was unable to swim straight. When he swam, he swam around in circles. So if you've ever um, known anyone to get really bad vertigo where they can't, the world is kind of spinning, that's what Pip was going through. So the x-rays here are for documentation and just to make sure we saw nothing on the inside. But if you were to see a tumor, it would almost look like a fluffy cloud or a cotton ball sitting inside of there. So where you see the dark gray, you would see almost like a cotton ball sitting on top. Does that make sense? You can move your mic and show it. How do I do? My husband's teaching me how to use the mouse. Sorry about that. I'm going to try to draw what it would look like. I need to stop sharing so the mouse will come back. It's oh. not showing. No, that's okay. We just won't be able to do it. But um, does that make sense what I'm describing, like with a cotton ball appearance? Yeah. I just didn't know if that black thing on the top was a tumor. Um, oh, the very circular thing? Like there's some black gray areas and there's a very round black structure. Is that what you're asking about? Right. right. So that's actually a piece of intestines coming out. So if you think about all the intestines, I think of them like a bowl of spaghetti and all the little spaghetti pieces are going every which direction. So if an intestinal loop is coming straight out at you because it's a 3D structure, mm -hmm. then you'll see a black circle like that. Thankfully, no, no tumors. Oh. Sorry, didn't mean to skip that ahead. Um, so this is what the external tumors look like. Um, yeah, this is the next slide. So the first picture here, that's a green sea turtle. I know it's hard to tell. I tried to flip him to where he'd be right side up, but it just made it look funny because he's actually on his back in this picture. Um, you can appreciate this turtle was very emaciated, malnutritioned, dehydrated when he came in to see us because he couldn't see anything. These, all of the pink and yellow structures that you see are tumors attached to the tissues around his eyes. So to kind of orient you guys, um, the right in the center of this image is his beak or his mouth. The two black circles down below that, those are his nares or his nose. And then his flippers are kind of hanging out to the side. All of the pink yellow stuff is abnormal tissue. We didn't know when this guy came in if he would be able to see after tumor removal. He had no internal tumors, which was amazing. Um, when we did his surgeries, he took three surgeries to get all of his tumors off. Thankfully, it was all on the eyelids and the structures around the eye. There was actually nothing on the cornea, which is the, the surface. If you put contacts in, you touch your cornea. There were none on that surface. And so once we removed all the tumors, he was actually able to see. Um, he was released um, about a year and a half after he came in to see us. He was able to go back out into the wild, which is amazing. Um, there is a doctor, Dr. Karpinski is an ophthalmologist. She's donated a lot of her time to coming down and helping us, or helping them, I guess now. But she will actually remove tumors from the surface of the eye, from the cornea. It is not something that um, your general practice doctor is going to do. It takes a lot of very good skill, but she's donated a lot of time for us, and so we've been able to release more turtles. Um, we'll talk about release again at the more near the end, but if a turtle is deemed to be blind, he cannot be re-released. Ultimately, we don't want these guys to suffer, um, so if a turtle is blind, there is no way to release him. You could rehabilitate him and find him a new home, but not out into the wild. And then over to the right, this sea turtle, I have to admit, is not my patient. Um, I called Betty. She's the lady who runs the sea turtle hospital just to get her permission to, to talk about them, to show some of their pictures. Um, and they were doing surgery on this guy. If any of you follow the sea turtle hospital on their Facebook page, which you should because they show some amazing cases, this guy had surgery a week and a half ago. That is the largest tumor to date found on a sea turtle. So this is a loggerhead sea turtle, and his tumor weighed 14.2 pounds when it was removed. And that is attached, I don't even know if you can tell from this image, but that's attached to his flipper. So if this is his flipper, this would be the tumor attaching the entire thing. Needless to say, he couldn't move that flipper. He could not effectively catch food. He could not effectively dive down. 
Um, he was floating on the surface. You can actually tell from his shell that there's a lot of growth on there that indicates that he was at the surface of the water for a long time. Turtles are meant to dive. They're not meant to live on the surface. And so they can sustain sunburns just like we would. Um, dehydration is extremely common in these guys and malnutrition because he's not eating. The other thing to think about, which is the, as a veterinarian, there's good news, bad news associated with everything. So the good news with this disease is that because we can treat it, we get to see a lot of other diseases in turtles. And we were able to transfuse blood transfusions. Um, we first, docu first started doing that about 10 years ago in sea turtles because if this turtle comes in and he has a 14.2 pound mass on his leg, there's a lot of blood that's going into that mass to keep it alive. And so he came in in addition to malnourished, dehydrated, and suffering from sunburn issues. He came in anemic because a lot of his blood supply was in that mass, which we're going to take off. So essentially we're going to take a lot of his blood supply. Um, so we first started doing transfusions when I was down in the Keys about 10, 10 and a half, 10, 11 years now. Um, we've been able to do transfusions. We have learned that you can give loggerhead and sea turtles can share blood sometimes. Um, not the case with the other species. But we've been able to do a lot and advance medicine a lot because we've been able to work on these guys. So good news, bad news, horrible disease, but it's enabled us to, to advance medicine pretty significantly. 15 years ago, I don't think anyone would have touched this tumor with a 10-foot pole. But Dr. Norton, um, Dr. Terry Norton, who works in South Georgia at the Sea Turtle Hospital there, he actually went down to the Keys to do the surgery, which was amazing. If you go on their Facebook page, they recorded, I think, the first maybe two to five minutes of the surgery itself. So you can see the beginnings of the surgery. They don't show anything gross. There's no blood or things that might make anyone pass out. Um, but this, I just thought he was impressive. I do not know what his name is. I don't know if they had named him by the time Betty and I talked. I think they said his name's Chomper. Chomper? Okay. That would make sense. Uh, I believe it. Question. Um, is, is it a uh, disease, zoonosis, where it's trans... Um, Trans, uh, transmitted through humans to what could be human. No, thankfully this is sea turtles only. Most of the herpes viruses are very species specific, meaning if I have herpes virus, I can't give it to my dog and vice versa. So, and this is sea turtles only. It's not known to be transmissible to any other turtle species or tortoise species. Um, it's, it's interesting. There are very few viruses that can actually transmit between species. Influenza is one, rabies is one, maybe COVID is one, um, depending on the reports that you read. But there's a small handful of viruses that can actually go between species. It's pretty difficult for them just because of how varied our DNA and our genetics are. So thankfully, just the six sea turtle species get it, not the leatherbacks. But great question. And you cannot catch this from swimming in the ocean or working on them. Or pass it on, right? If you have herpes, you can't pass it on to a sea turtle. Correct. Like I would, I would not go and work on a FP turtle, not wash my hands, and oh. then go work on another turtle because it could be on my hands like, physically. But I could, if I worked on one and then washed my hands afterwards, I'd be fine to, tr to go back and forth between the species or between the animals, which we did. They kept them. I'll show you the picture in a little bit of a hospital setting. All the FP turtles are kept very separate from the non-FP turtles, but it's not transmissible by air. Um, it's not transmissible by any other structure, just on surfaces and from turtle to turtle. Dr. Bruce, a question. Yes, ma'am. So after the, term, after the tumors are removed, is there a concern of recurrence? Yes. So the goal is there's a time limit on these surgeries. So we can only keep the an animal under for a certain amount of time. We actually found if they were under anesthesia for too long, the tips of their flippers would start to suffer from lack of blood supply. Mm -hmm. And tumor, uh, flipper damage is not a good thing for an animal that you want to re-release. So it would take – some turtles are lucky. One surgery, we're able to get them all off. But literally when I would start surgery, they would start the timer. And when the timer went off, I was done, no matter – where I was, which was very frustrating sometimes. Um, so sometimes it was one surgery, sometimes it was three, four surgeries to get all the tumors off. Mm -hmm. And then after that, 
every turtle is monitored for one year from being tumor free before okay. they're considered to be actually in remission. We cannot prove cure. Um, to date, to my knowledge, there's not a cure for this condition. But if a turtle does not get new, tr new tumors or recurrence of tumors within one year, it's deemed to be cancer free. Um, it was not uncommon for them to call me to do a surgery on a turtle that had been there for six months, tumor free for six months, and then a new one pops up. As soon as we see a new one, we do another surgery, remove all the tumors, and then start the time again for one year. If a turtle has more than one bout of recurrence, then we repeat the entire workup. They get repeat x-rays, they get repeat endoscopy, looking to see if there were maybe at the time of presentation, there might have been some tiny tumors on the inside that we couldn't appreciate. Mm -hmm. And then the theory is that those would then reseed the skin, so to speak. Mm -hmm. um, but if the internals remain negative, once they were free for a year, then they were considered cure. Okay. Or, sorry, remission. Right, right. Mm -hmm. Sorry. I love computers. There we go. Um, so I did not include any gross pictures. I apologize for the bottom right one. There is a little bit of blood, so just ignore that if you don't like that. Um, but I wanted to include a couple of pictures of what surgery looks like in these guys. Um, so there is a lot of debate as to how reptiles feel pain and what can we do about it. So we are very careful. We All of these animals went under full anesthesia, and we addressed their pain potential in several different methods. So in the first picture there, that is me doing what's called intubation. So if anyone has ever had surgery before and they put a tube down your throat into your trachea or your windpipe, that's what we're doing here. Turtles bite really hard. So we put, um, you see in the second picture at the very top of that image, there's actually a, a ring of PVC pipe that we wedge in their mouth so they can't clamp down on my fingers or the tube. And then we put the tube in the throat and the machine behind me there is actually a human-grade anesthesia machine that has a ventilator on it. What that means is once we turn on the machine, that machine is breathing for the patient. So he's giving him a breath every 30 seconds, which doesn't seem like much, two breaths a minute, but that's all they need. Um, and it's also passing gas anesthesia to them the entire time, keeping them under anesthesia and providing them with some pain relief. Um, we also do what's called a local block on all of these tumors. So any tumor that I'm removing, I put a local anesthetic in there. So if you've ever had a freckle removed and they uh, injected a really painful stinging injection, that was a local block. These animals are under anesthesia, so they don't feel that, hopefully. Um, in addition to the local block, they get injectable pain medications. So we're very careful not to cause them any more pain than they've already felt. The second picture is a turtle on his back, and I believe, yes, all of these are green sea turtles in this picture. Um, so the second picture with the arrows is a green sea turtle laying on his back, and those are all of the tumors that need to be removed that you can see from this image. Um, upper left is on his flipper. The upper right is kind of in his armpit area. And then you can see all of those pink irregular structures around his lower flippers and around his tail and rect our cloaca, those are all tumors. Some of them are what we call wide-based. So you have a tumor and you have a wide base to it to where you have to take off a lot of tissue. Some of them are narrow-based. So there'll be a large tumor with a skinny stalk, which are easier to remove. Um, but either way, they leave a pretty decent piece of tissue that's gone. And the picture on the upper right um, I'm using what's called a laser. So we use a cutting laser to remove all of these. It increases, it speeds us up. It makes it a faster surgery. It leads to less blood loss. And it also is considered to be less painful. But the nice thing in this upper right picture, you can actually see all of the dark brown black areas. Those are areas where I've already removed tumors. And actually laying on the towel next to the turtle, you can see the tumors that have been removed. Um, this is not considered a sterile process, meaning they don't have to be, nothing has to be kept aseptic, because if you think about it, these turtles are going right back into the water. So we clean everything very well. The surface of the turtle is kept very clean, um, but this is essentially the method that they go through for removal. And then the bottom picture 
it may look a little bit funny. So that's a turtle kind of on his back side and his two back flippers are held together and taped together mostly so that they're out of the way so I can get into that, that area in there. Um, in this picture, I'm actually closing the holes where we had the endoscope go in, um, but he's about to get tumor removals of all of those pink irregular spots around his legs. Those are all about to come off as well. Does that make sense? It's weird to see things in pictures sometimes. All right. So after surgery, so if you go in and you have surgery after anesthesia, you may take 30 minutes up to two hours to fully recover. Um, turtles may take five hours, 24 hours. Everything's much, much slower in these guys. Um, so the turtle hospital has an amazing team of staff that are prepared to work around the clock if need be in recovery. Um, so both of these are green sea turtles again. This is actually, these are different turtles. Um, but the turtle in the left picture, that weird kind of brownish, orangish circle just behind his head, that's where his, one of his larger tumors were removed from. You can see a couple of other spots around. Um, you can see the PVC pipe that's in his beak holding his mouth open. And then the tube that the person is holding onto, that's his endotracheal tube that's going down into his trachea or his windpipe. If you've seen CPR done on TV, where they put the mask over the person's face and they squeeze the bag, that's what we're doing there. So we're squeezing room air into his lungs, apparently, to keep breathing for him. And that is done for hours until they start to move on their own. Um, the other tube going into him, kind of just in front of his shoulder area there, that's actually fluids. So most of these animals are dehydrated. Even if they've been in hospital for a couple of weeks, we still always give them fluids while they're under to make sure we're maintaining hydration and to help flush the drugs back out of their system, essentially. And then the picture over to the right is a turtle after he's been moving on his own, breathing on his own. Um, his tube has been removed. But I included this picture because you can see the extent that some of these tumors can leave behind. Um, and everything happens slow in turtles. This, these wounds will take weeks to close. There is no way to close them. So if they do surgery on you and remove a freckle, they're going to put a suture in there to close that skin back together. Um, it's not possible in these guys because we're taking this much tissue and their skin is not near as stretchy as ours is. So we leave all of these open. Um, every single one of these animals is treated with pain medications afterwards. A lot of them are what we call tube fed afterwards. So if they don't feel like eating, we can actually pass a feeding tube down into their stomach and give them food. Um, and they're also treated with both topical and oral antibiotics. So these guys here are what we call dry docked. Any animal that's supposed to live in the water, if you take them out of the water, that's not where they're supposed to be. So we can dry dock these animals for a short period of time, but they do need to get back in the water, otherwise everything will start to dry out. So once we put them back into the water, no matter how clean the environment is, there is still bacteria, yeast, viruses in the water. Um, so all of these animals are kept on topical and oral antibiotics until those wounds heal, which again can take weeks, months sometimes. Um, it would not be uncommon for me to do surgery and then see the same turtle a month later to do a repeat surgery and have his wounds still be in a process of healing. So you tend to, like if you have a turtle and there's tumors everywhere on his body, you do some from a section and then you do a very different section and then a very different section so that you give the tissues time to heal before you remove more from that section. And then after post-op recovery, they go into the hospitalization tanks. And this is what I was talking about earlier, Doreen, with the, the separation. Um, so that tiny little sweet girl there is one of my favorite technicians. She was amazing. Um, she's actually still down there working with the sea turtles. But the side that she's on is not the FP side. The side behind the fence is the FP side. So this is not spread via air. It's not aerosolized. So it's fine for them to be all open air together. But the water systems, all of the machinery that you see kind of in the background, those are all the water systems, the um, filtration systems, making sure that the water coming into the turtles is as fresh and clean as possible and it's pumped straight out of the ocean. So it's straight ocean water just coming in, getting filtered first. Um, 
the water for the FP turtles is kept separate from the other ones. And on the FP side, each individual tank has its own water source. So meaning the water from tank A way back in the back does not go into tank B to tank C to tank D, because then we were talking earlier about them um, having recurrence. They would absolutely have recurrence because we'd just be feeding them with more virus. So each water system is separate, which is definitely an endeavor <laughs> to do. Um, the water filtration system there, I am not an aquarist and I don't want to be an aquarist. They did an amazing job setting this up. Um, the dry docking that we were talking about, once the turtles go back into the water, their water level is kept very low. So where they're literally just sitting on the bottom and they can lift their head to breathe. So if you see tank two and a couple of the other ones, you don't see any water in them, but there are turtles in there. The water level is just so low because whatever turtle is in that tank can't swim up to breathe. The green sea turtle right here in the front with his romaine lettuce, he is obviously doing pretty good. His water tank is almost completely filled to where he can swim around. Um, I don't know if you can appreciate from the picture in the front of his tank is some PVC piping, and that is his toys. So they give they give them toys. They will throw them around. They'll swim in and around them. They have different places they can put food. So it gives, I mean, this is a small space for a turtle, but they do everything they can to give them enrichment and something to do so they don't just get bored. But these turtles in this tank, the ones that are injured, once they're healed, they go back out into the wild. The ones that are FP turtles, they may spend 6, 8, 12 months in these tanks. Um, so they do, the staff is really good. They get in with each turtle every day to try to give them some enrichment. Um, normally in a rehab setting, you don't want to interact with the animals too terribly much because you don't want to habituate them to humans. Um, not a problem we have with sea turtles, thankfully. So the staff is constantly in with them, making sure they're safe and healthy. And then I included just a, a close-up here of a turtle in the ICU tank. Um, and this turtle's hanging out down on the bottom, but his water depth is enough that he could swim up to the top to take a breath. And then for those who have been there longer, either they're nearing the end of their FP stay, and or they've been deemed non-releasable. This is the pool that I was mentioning in the beginning. And whoever designed this hotel in the way back when did an amazing job. This pool, they did not redo. This pool is actually rock bottom and rock side. Just It's very natural. And so the turtles that are in there, it's hard to get pictures that can show it. But in the picture to the right, these turtles have a sandy bottom. It's an ocean bottom, just like they'd be used to. The sides of the the pool are all rock as if they're just going up against a rock quarry or anything like that in the wild. And so these guys are kept as natural as possible. And this water actually goes up and down with the tides. So, you know, yeah, you can't see it from this image, but back in the backdrop, that is the ocean. There's just a little bit of, of land there before you get to the pool. And the water from the ocean is piped directly in and out of this pool. So the tides go up and down. Their water quality is just the same as the natural ocean. Um, and the turtles will stay here. There's a couple of turtles that we lovingly call bubble butts because they, they have bubbles in their butts and they can't dive down anymore. <laughs> so some of those turtles will live in this tank for the rest of their life. Some have been rehomed to aquaria around the country, um, but they're used as educational animals at that point because if they – we cannot get the bubbles out, and they can't dive down. They can't be re-released. Um, if a turtle loses both front flippers, both back flippers, or both flippers on the same side, so both rights or both lefts, they're deemed non-releasable. And if a turtle is blind, he's deemed non-releasable. So if he loses one eye, he can be released. One flipper, he can be released. Um, but because they're protected species, it's very specific of what can and cannot be re-released. And so any animal that can't be re-released either lives his days out here or gets re-released. Um, if you make it out to um, Mandalay Bay in Las Vegas, they have one of our turtles there. Um, I believe the turtle at the aquarium in Tampa is one of the sea turtle hospital turtles too, but don't quote. Yeah, actually, I believe that's true. Um, that is one that was down there as well. So a lot of the turtles around – in Aquaria, if you watch really closely or you look really closely, they'll either be missing 
most of their flippers or they'll be missing their eyes, something like that. But it's because they can't be re-released. And that's how these aquarium can have animals humanely without going and capturing, capturing them from the wild. Um, but these, these guys have a pretty good life. And if you go down there to visit, um, I showed you the picture or the window earlier where you can watch procedures going on. They have, you can actually go in and see where the radiology equipment is, the blood equipment is. And then you can't tell from this picture, but there's a don't fall in fence lining it. So you actually get to go out and you can feed the sea turtles. They don't let you get up close and personal with a lot of the hospitalized ones just because of stress factors. Um, but you can go in and feed the sea turtles there too, which is pretty cool. Um, so I'm going to non-shamelessly put a plug in for the Sea Turtle Hospital. If you're ever down in the Keys, you should absolutely go visit. It's a very neat experience down there. Um, but it's, it's, they're doing amazing things for the Sea Turtles. And one of these days, I'll get back down there probably. But until then, we're going to put in the token dog picture for everyone. Um, this is my newest addition. This is Zara, my 11-month-old puppy who is still sleeping soundly through this entire meeting, which is fabulous. Um, and I put my contact information down at the bottom as well. That's my personal email address as well as the clinic phone number. If anyone has any questions about this or any other aspects of their animal's care, I'm more than happy to help out. Are there any questions today? I just want to say that when you go down to the turtle hospital, you get to see iguanas of all sizes as well. They're all, oh, like, yes. all over there in all shades. Yes. And just it's, it's a beautiful experience if you can get a chance to go down there. Yeah, and they have that long are... time. Okay, go. Read so we can see if anybody has questions. <laughs> now, if you go down there, the Dolphin Research Center, um, the Turtle Hospital, mm -hmm. and I believe Theater of the Seas, at least, when I was there, um, they will actually have the iguanas spayed or neutered. So... There's a population problem with iguanas down there, and so they'll spare new to them to allow them to still live out their days without having all the fights and all the problems. So you'll usually see, like if you go to the hospital, you'll see one really big orange iguana who's the dominant male, and then you'll see lots of other smaller males that have been neutered, um, and then the females and stuff like that. But it's really cool because they, you're right, anytime you go down there, tons of animals. We went, we rescued a, uh, a green sea turtle a few years back, my grandson and I did, and, and we were, uh, once they, uh, uh, the Clearwater Aquarium come picked it up and, and they rehabilitated it and everything. Uh, when they got ready to release it, they invited us out there to to uh, actually release the turtle. And That's really cool. It was awesome. and. Uh, but they, before they did that, they took us on a grand tour of, of the Clearwater Aquarium off the scenes of the hospital where they do the surgeries, where they prepare the food. I mean, we got to see everything, and it was a big, big, big impression on my grandson. But I was really impressed that you don't realize all the stuff that goes on that you don't see at the Clear, Clearwater Aquarium uh, behind the scenes. It was just, it was. Unbelievable. I couldn't, I couldn't believe what we got to see. They do a lot of rehabilitation there. Um, turtles and the Tampa Aquarium, I know that's not what it's called, the Tampa Aquarium does a lot with sea turtles too. Um, I don't believe either one of those groups do FP turtles unless something has changed in the past five to seven years. Clearwater, Clearwater Marine Aquarium has a big patch turtle uh, program. They do? Okay, yeah. good. Yeah, they've been doing surgery on patch turtles for years. It's from a veterinarian's perspective, it's a lot of fun, but it's nice to be able to give back because it's it's amazing what they're doing with these turtles right now. So much good care. Um, I have a question um, now with the pollution. So what is like what is it actually like? What pollution is actually causing those tumors? Is it like the runoff, or is it the plastic, or you know, like what do you think that that would be causing. The theories are more of chemical pollution, so agricultural runoff, pesticides, stuff like that. Um, there's constantly work going into trying to decrease the human impact of our environment. Um, we don't know, is the honest answer, exactly what part of what we're doing affects them negatively. It's interesting because 
Here in Florida, we've had significant increases in the number of FP turtles. We, our numbers go up every time they do the studies. In Hawaii, they saw a significant reduction. I think in the last decade, they've had 9.2% decrease in the amount of FP turtles that they see. Um, there's a lot of theory there. They don't tend to do surgery on these guys and re-release them. Most of the turtles in Hawaii, to the last of my knowledge, um, most of the turtles in Hawaii that come in with FPs are cold, which is the nice way of saying um, put to sleep. It's herd immunity. So the theory is if an animal has a contagious disease, don't put them back out into the environment where they could then spread that disease to others. Um, so some theorize that because Hawaii is not treating them, they're just removing them from the population. That's why they're seeing the reduction. Um, other theories are that because Hawaii is so much better than we are at keeping the environment cleaner, then that's why they're seeing less. The reality is we may never know, but it's definitely the, well, most likely the chemical runoff that we're seeing affects their immune status. So by making them less immune coherent, so their immune system is not as functional, they're more susceptible to the virus. Once they get the virus, they get the tumors. What about other countries like Australia and, mm -hmm. you know, in the Southern Hemisphere? What's mm -hmm. their statistics with this? Most of the countries, so there's a CIBA, I believe is the website, .org, has all the statistics listed out of which countries have had exposure to it, which countries don't have it anymore, or sorry, which countries have had lower numbers. Most of the countries, it increases every time, mm -hmm. unfortunately. I can't think of another one when I was looking through the list that's had a decrease lately, except for Hawaii. Dr. Bruce, could you take your screen off so we can see everybody that's there? Yeah, I think. So I can see because some new people showed up there. Any, any other questions for Dr. Bruce? Uh, Dr. Bruce, is that dog up for adoption? No way. <laughs> <laughs> My husband would kill me, but no. <laughs> okay. No, she is actually being an angel curled up <laughs> for this entire hour, which is great. It's a good dog. Yeah, that's a shame that we that we uh, we cause all those problems with all these sea turtles like that. That's, mm. that's just awful. Now, do you, Dr. Bruce, do you see a lot of those turtles come in like ingesting plastic bags and having those rings from the soda cans around mm -hmm. and stuff like that? Yeah, that's um, absolutely. The good thing is that the the turtle GI tract is a lot more basic than ours is, so we can put them under anesthesia and actually go in with the, the same camera, well, a different camera but a similar setup, and remove a lot of that stuff from the upper GI tract. And then we've gotten a very good system down that includes a lot of Beano, honestly, that helps to push everything through. And so we will monitor them as they poop out all the stuff. Um, if you go to this, I know the Sea Turtle Hospital has it. I'm 90% sure Clearwater has it. Um, if you go to any of these places that do a lot of turtle work, they will have containers full of junk yes. that has come out of turtles. Um, we actually went to, when we were in, um, what's out in California, the aquarium that we went to? We were at the Monterey Bay Aquarium. There's actually an artist who has taken all of this junk and turned it into artwork. It's beautiful, but sad, but beautiful. Awesome. Cut your turtle, or cut your rings. Don't put those in the trash. Earrings? <laughs> the, um, oh, the soda rings. Soda cans? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah because even if you put it in your trash, I see a lot of people's trash like blow over and, you know, so it's not, there, it's not like they're doing it on purpose, but, you know, we have high winds and their cans open up and, or even off the boats when, or kayaks, I see a lot of stuff that, you know, they, they get capsized and then all their stuff gets floating around. And back. Oh, yeah. And now we have to cut the masks, too. We're out fishing out there in the Gulf and stuff. They're just stuff floating all over the place. There's just no call for it, really. A lot of people just throw it over and don't even... They don't even care. Don't even care. Yeah. A lot of plastic bags. A lot of people don't contain their garbage in their boats and it blows out of the boats and stuff. So mm -hmm. it's just... And plastic bags are horrible because they'll float on the surface of the water and they look like food. And so the turtles will go up and eat it, thinking it's a squid or whatever have you. That, uh, we were constantly picking up balloons and plastic things. 
bags out there because when we see the stuff, we pick it up and we put it in our in our garbage can on the boat. But uh, it, it just I can't believe how much stuff that we pick up in just a little bit of area that we cover. Uh, the magnitude of the trash out there has got to be phenomenal. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and you've seen yeah. out, and I think it's like the Pacific Ocean that has that huge yes. island of trash. Yes. Mm. There was a guy on the news who actually um, developed some some boat with like claws to go mm -hmm. to get to get that up, and that was about a year ago that I saw that on the news. So hopefully, yeah. uh, he was working with Greenpeace to get that going. That would be awesome. I would love to be a part of that. I don't want to go that far out in the ocean. <laughs> Aquarium in New Orleans has a small exhibit. It's a converted jellyfish tank that they've put plastic bags into. Mm -hmm. And because of the circulation, you see how it might look like a jelly. Um, That's really cool. And they say, does this look like a jellyfish to you? Um, there are places, uh, Inner Harbor, right next to the aquarium in Baltimore where they have deployed Mr. Trash Wheel that it is a paddle wheel on the front of a barge that I guess they have float lines out across the, the, the mouth of the stream or the river there that it funnels floating plastic waste into this, uh, this paddle wheel and it has gigantic googly eyes on it and sitting out in the harbor and they're filling up this barge with trash that they end up swapping out and putting in new containers for that they've been getting massive amounts of garbage skimmed out of inner harbor that way I mean, it's great that they're doing it but it's horrible that they have to yeah wow. well awesome thank you so much Yay. absolutely